All right. Let me just do that. Let's just do one little thing here. Playing a little Eve Online. Doing a little mining with uh, Linknet, the silent company. There we go. All right. Oh, this was one I I ne I didn't realize how quite how well this guy had uh, actually written all of this. So from Brie Fault, The Mothers, Chapter 18, The Witch and the Priestess. This is, uh, I'm hopefully going to touch on the part that really starts to explain a lot about where we are right now. Primitive religion, not speculative. It has been almost universally assumed that women have had little, if any, part in the development of religious systems, even though they have often been their chief votaries. Such an idea should not be accepted as self-evident. True, women are little disposed to construct speculative systems, but it would be profoundly wrong to suppose that religious ideas have grown out of intellectual systems, rather the reverse. Primitive man is strangely unconcerned about philosophical questions. The following question were put to a very intelligent Zulu. Have you any knowledge of the power by whom the world was made? When you see the sun rising and setting and the trees growing, do you know who made them and governs them? The Zulu, after a thoughtful pause, replied, No, we see them, but cannot tell how they come. We suppose they come of themselves. The totem as creator. The totem is by its very nature the tribe's progenitor and creator. This creative function is naturally extended to include the creation of the habitat of the tribe, i.e. the world. The animal nature of ancestral totems is, we have seen, but vaguely differentiated from their human nature. The iguana, the turtle, the emu, in Australia, the great hare, the white eagle in America, the great raven in Siberia, are all tribal fathers, supreme magicians, creators. To the tribal ancestor are generally ascribed all the functions traceable to a superior agency controlling the destinies of the tribe. He instituted the tribal customs of which no one knows the origin and is angry at any breach of them. In more advanced stages, the totem or mythic ancestor of the oldest and most influential clan occupies a position superior to that of all other tribal totems. He is not merely a clan ancestor, but a tribal ancestor, a tribal god. He is not merely the source of a particular supply of food, but a dispenser of subsistence, the controller of the tribe's fortunes. The dominant clan is the mediator between the tribe and the controller of its destinies. The headman of the sacred clan is the representative of the god, his ancestor, and he is earthly avatar. His incarnation is indistinguishable from the god himself. In Madagascar, the king is simply known as God on Earth and the creation of the world is, is ascribed to one of his ancestors, the Queen of Angola, on being asked who made the world and who fecundated the ground and ripened the fruits thereof, replied without hesitation, my ancestors, then rejoined the Capuchin, who was catechizing her. Does your majesty enjoy the whole power of your ancestors? Yes, answered the Queen and much more, for over and above what they had, I am absolute mistress of the kingdom of Matamba. The divine king does not derive his status from any personal merit or attribute, but from the fact of his descent from the god. With the development by ambitious conquerors of royal power, the character of the divine ancestor is enormously enhanced. To us the identification of primitive kings with the supreme deity appears sacrilege or flattery, but, as a matter of fact, 
it is not so much the royal personage who is exalted by being assimilated to a god as the primitive god who is exalted by the attributes of his earthly representative. The rude tribal god, who is in general treated with scanty reverence, first acquires majesty when impersonated by a powerful monarch. The ancestral god has a special function, closely related to his original totemic character, rainmaking. Whatever may be the source of a people's food supply, the most important factor determining its abundance is the weather, and especially the rainfall. It is difficult for us to realize fully the meaning of rain or drought to the primitive man. In Australia, a drought means misery and death to the blacks. In South Africa, remarks Father Junod, drought is equivalent to famine and famine to death. The rain from heaven has been the supreme determinant of the history of humanity, the great movements of prehistory which have determined the present distribution of human races, took place mainly, if not solely, under the urge of the fatal drought. What is now the great African desert was one of the first regions from which peoples were driven northwards by the failure of the means of subsistence to people Mediterranean shores and northern Europe. Thus it is not by mere poetic fancy that heaven is the abode of the gods, the supreme gods of early religions, not only dwell in heaven, but are the heavens or the heavenly bodies, thought of as controllers of the seasons and of atmospheric conditions. Among the Chi-speaking peoples, the divine name Nyamkum means sky or rain. Just one moment. I have to make sure I'm on top of making them big money. Uh-oh. Oh, yes. Yes, Eric. X-22 was once long time ago on YouTube. Yeah. Long ago. <laughs> Among the Makwas, the same word means sky, clouds, or god, with the besetos of the upper Nile. The supreme god was simply the rainmaker. The same nomenclature obtains in Asia. Among the Mongols, the supreme god is Tengr. The sky in China, Di, the sky in Vedic India, Dieus, the sky in Persia, Ahura, the azure sky. In Greece, he was Zeus, the sky, the god, cloud compeller, Yahweh, the god of the ancient Hebrews, was a rain god. He shall come unto us as the rain, says the prophet Hosea, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. Thus, it is that one of the chief, if not indeed the chief functions of all the primitive priests, kings, was the control of the weather, and more particularly of the rainfall, as Fraser has pointed out. I believe that's a reference to the golden bough. A king was primarily a maker of rain, and originally was probably the head man of the clan, which was credited with the greatest power of wielding such control. All African kings were primarily rain makers. For instance, the function of the king of Loango, which most impressed the first missionaries, was his obligation to make rain. In Somaliland, a chief is known as the Prince of Rain. Throughout the continent, in fact, the chief was the great rain maker of the tribe. Even the kings of ancient Egypt were rain makers, although Egypt, where it scarcely ever rains, would appear to be about the last place for a rain maker to set up. Pharaoh's control of the waters was naturally applied more often to regulating the river, and he caused it to rise by casting into the Nile a written order to do so. Conversely, the most important ceremony at the court of the king of Siam was that at which the king, like Canute, issued through heralds a solemn order to the river of Mainam to retire. The emperor of China also had a similar office, Hindu, doctrines teach that Indra sends no rain upon a kingdom which has lost its king. Ulysses explains to Penelope that, under a virtuous prince, the earth brings forth barley and wheat in abundance. Trees are loaded with fruit, ewes sit several times in succession, and the sea is filled with fish. Of so great worth is a good leader.
The control thus exercised by sacred kings over heaven for the benefit of the people is thoroughly practical and is exactly of the same kind as that exercised by members of a totem clan over their totem. The purpose of primitive religion is eminently utilitarian. It is part and parcel of the means employed to supply and control the necessities of life to promote the prosperity of the tribe and above all to provide its food. The really important question, as Robertson Smith remarked, is not what a god has power to do, but whether I can get him to do it for me. This is why those divinities which, judged by a theological criterion, appear to correspond most closely to the conception of a god, the creators and controllers of the universe, are in most primitive religions not the objects of worship. Thus, Bahima, the Bahima, who worship a tribal ancestor, have also a god, Lugava, but they know very little about him. He has no priests, and so receives no sacrifices. The supreme god of Dahomey is ignored rather than worshipped. The same remarks apply to all African populations. In West Africa, generally, they regard the god as the creator of man, plants, animals, and the earth, and they hold that, having made them, he takes no further interest in the affair. The god, in the sense we use the word, is in essence the same thing in all Bantu tribes I have met with, says Miss Kingsley, a non-interfering and therefore negligible quantity. Similarly, the American Indians nowhere adored the god they knew. The tribes of Guiana thought they have the notion of a supreme being concerned themselves little about him. In Australia, although they have the notion of a supreme being concerned themselves little about him, in Australia, Bayame, in whom some enthusiasts thought they recognized a supreme being, is believed by the Queensland tribes, says Mr. Thorne, to have gone away over the ocean so long ago that our informant could know, give no idea of the lapse of time, and therefore took further heed of the country or its inhabitants. Of Daramulum, another Australian supreme being, there is no worship. The incongruity of divine beings who form no part of religion becomes intelligible when it is borne in mind that primitive religion refers to practical issues. The god in whom primitive man is interested is not the sky god, but the tribal ancestor, who is also the supreme magician, who can use his power to control the sky god. Since then, primitive religion has little concern with philosophical speculations. The natural inaptitude of women for such speculation is irrelevant. The exclusion of women from religious functions in the West. Nowadays in Christian and other strongly patriarchal societies, example, Brahminical India or China, the notion of women exercising priestly functions often offends propriety, the suggestion that they should preach and administer sacraments is regarded as an extravagance of feminism. Such notions are comparatively recent. The ancient world was full of priestesses. The Vestal priestesses were one of the most ancient and sacred institutions of Roman cult when walking abroad. They were preceded by lictors bearing the insignia of supreme command. Any insult was punishable with death. Uh-oh. Oh, oh, I'm not. Look at that. Look at that, Donna. It's slipping. It's slipping in space. Okay, there we go. Let's see. There we go. Yes, yes. Let's get that. Gotta compress that oar. Gotta compress that oar. Can't get caught slipping. Keep those lasers up. Lasers up. Lasers up. In earlier times, they and other priestesses, the Regina Sacrorum, the Flaminicae, uh, played an even more important part in Italian cult. Ancient Italy swarmed with priestly and prophetic women, who often exercised greater influence than the official priestesses. The Sibyls of classic tradition are the types of prophetic females or shamanesses, the most sacred shrines of Greece, such as those of Delphi and Dodona, were served by prophetic women. 
the priestess of Demeter, like the Vestals of at Roman spectacles, occupied a throne of honor at the Olympic Games. There can be little doubt that in these primitive cults, which later became connected with Dionysus, priestly functions were exercised exclusively by women. In Aegean and Cretan religion, archaeological evidence shows us priestesses discharging all religious functions. As in Greece, so in Babylonia and Assyria, says Professor Sais, women were inspired prophets prophetesses of the god in Assyrian inscriptions they are called the mothers. None but women were allowed to enter the Holy of Holies of Bel Marduk in Carthage. Likewise, women mediated between the great goddess and the people. In ancient Egypt, the queen was high priestess of Ra. There were many orders of priestesses under the Old and the Middle Kingdom, and at the time of the New Empire there was scarcely a woman from the highest to the lowest who was not connected with the service of the temples. Priestesses in Uncultured Societies In primitive cultures, the part played by women in religious cults is striking. In the state religion of Dahomey, at least as many women as men exercise priestly functions. Priestesses undergo a three years course of initiation. They are called mothers. Their person is inviolable, in, inviolable, and they enjoy great privileges. In most African kingdoms, such as Ashanti, Orua, and Uganda, the temples of deceased kings are served by colleges of priestesses and vestals. The most dreaded deity of Matabeleland was served by a college of priestesses who were regarded as his daughters. Even King Lobengula had at times to yield to it. The numerous female fetiches... Now, this was a, world I, a word I don't know. Fetiches or mother fetiches, fetiche, fetiche, um, it's probably fetiche, uh, throughout Africa, uh, it's a C-H, F-E-T-I-C-H-E-S, uh, throughout Africa are served exclusively by women. Some of them rise to positions of enormous influence. In Luango, the priestess of Atita was called the mother of God. Throughout the Congo, both sexes exercise magical and priestly functions. Among the Eskimo, the shamans, or Angakut may be either men or women, but Dr. Rink maintained that formerly all magicians were women. Today in East Greenland, there are two classes of sorcerers, the Angakut proper and the Gilalik, an inferior order. The latter are nearly all women. Dr. Rink believes that the male Angakut ousted them from their former positions. Among the North American Indians, medicine women were as famous as medicine men, and on some occasions, such as the corn feast, they exercised almost unlimited authority. Their influence appears to have been greater among the prairie and western tribes than among the more advanced eastern nations. Among the tribes of California, they are reported to have been particularly numerous. Among the Yurok tribes of the Klamath River district, the shamans were almost all women. So among the Zuni, though today the rain-making ceremonies are in the hands of priests, although the priestly college may consists of men at their head is a woman, the priestess of fertility. She can dismiss any of the priests at a moment's notice without offering a reason. There are several secret societies, but there is only one person among the Zuni who is a member of all the sacred societies, and thus knows the secrets of all, and that person is a woman. Competition often develops between the sexes for the possession of the power derived from the exercise of magical and religious functions. Accordingly, there are frequently reserved to one or the other sex, but such a monopoly is not characteristic of societies which have reached a considerable degree of development under undisturbed matriarchal rule. Thus, among the Cassis of Assam, the priestesses perform all the rites and sacrifices, but as among the Pueblo Indians, the men are not excluded, although the male officiants are only the deputies of the priestesses. This is where it starts getting interesting, gentlemen. The male, the ultimate authority, rests with the priestess, who is also invariably the keeper of the sacred magical objects. From a cursory perusal, okay, I thought I heard 
thought I heard Garista Pirates trying to get my magical space rocks. Hold on a second. Boom. Wow. Okay. I am, I am super efficient right now. We got dank boosts in the fleet. Our, our fleet has dank, dank boosts. Alright, so... From a cursory perusal of the most accessible accounts of Central America in the days of the European conquest, one would gather the impression that, although there was a considerable sprinkling of shamanistic women, the wizard or paje was usually a man. Dr. Brinton's close examination reveals a very different state of things. The pajes were a member of a closely organized and widely spread association, which has been termed Nagualism. A remarkable feature of this mysterious organization, says Dr. Brinton, was the exalted position it assigned to women. Not only were they admitted to the most esoteric degrees, but in repeated instances they occupied the various highest posts in the organization. Note, the notion common in other parts of the world, the shaman can transform himself into an animal, and that this power is somehow bound up with a spiritual double, or nagual, dwelling in the animal. Not only were they admitted to the most... Okay, Pascual de, de Andagoya asserts from his own knowledge that some of the female adepts had attained a rare and peculiar power of being in two places at once. Spanish writings of the 16th and 17th century confirm the dread in which they were held. In the, sac in the sacraments of Nagualism, women was the primate and hierophant, Brinton declares. In Guatemala, a supreme ministrant of the gods was a priestess, and it was to her that the warriors applied to ensure victory. In many Native American legends, as in others from the old world, some powerful enchantress is remembered as the founder of the state. Such among the Aztecs was the sorceress who built the city of Malinalco, Mayanalco famed even after the conquest for the skill of its magicians who claimed a descent from her. Such in Honduras was Coamazaglo, Queen of Cherki, or, or Ser, 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 Serchui, Serchui, uh, versed in occult science, who died not, but at the close of her earthly career rose to heaven. In the position of sorceresses <coughs> in South America <coughs> would appear to have been similar. Among all the tribes of the Amazon, old women are the interpreters of the gods. In Patagonia, the old women, witches, prophetesses, and div divineresses are the chief ministers of their cult. Throughout the Indonesian archipelago, archipelago the primitive aboriginal cults, where they have not been supplanted by Islam and other foreign religions, are predominantly and often exclusively served by women. Thus, among the Bataks of Sumatra, the shamans may be either men or women, but female shamans are far more common, and in several districts there are none but female shamans. In numerous other Pacific islands, such as Timor and the southern Moluccas, the shamans are predominantly women. Among the Dayak tribes of Borneo, religious functions are almost exclusively exercised by women. The shamans are far the most part women, seldom men. The same is true of the southern Celebes, where they are known as imitation women. All the deities or spirits from whom sorceresses, whether male or female, derive their power are spoken of as their grandmother. According to the tradition of the land Dayaks, the magic art was first imparted by Tupa, the women's deity, to a woman who was taught by her to her successors. It seems to me more than likely, says Miss M. Morris, that monongism, shamanism, was originally a profession of women and that men were gradually admitted into it, at first only by becoming as much like women as possible. 
we may here note that any attempt to draw a sharp line between the private magical practices of the shamanist and more dignified office of the official priestess proves futile in practice, thus in Indonesia, where the people themselves draw a distinction between the shamanesses and the priestesses, both Dr. Wilkin and Dr. Kruit, Kruit, the highest authorities on the religious usages of the region, are compelled to admit that there is no psychological distinction between the two. Both priestess, priestesses and shamanesses are in exactly the same condition of spiritual possession, and the magical procedure ritually observed in the public cult is identical with the practice of the individual witch or shamaness. The distinction between the two is not religious or psychological, but social and official. Among the Polynesian races who originally came from the Indonesian region, power has become concentrated in the hands of chiefs and the aristocratic classes. To this is due both the decay of popular religious cult, the priestly offices being for the most part under the jurisdiction of chiefs and ruling classes. Wow, okay, I am totally filling up fast now. That happened quick. That I'm, I'm. This is happening fast now. Okay, I'm almost. I bet I'm almost full up. Hold on there. Press, please. Let's stack all this. Let's stack. Let's select all. Let's stack all, because then it's easier to look at. Clean up. Clean, clean. Everything nice and clean. Let's see. Where are we at? Where we got? Oh, okay. I'm half full. Half full. Unless I can press it. Okay. The priestly offices being for the most part under the jurisdiction of the chiefs and ruling classes, and the masculine exclusiveness, if not the patriarchal character of Polynesian institutions, women were, as a rule, excluded in Polynesia from the sacred rights of men, so it is all the more remarkable that official priestesses occupy a high position in many Polynesian islands. Thus there are priestesses in Rotuma, Tonga, Samoa, Palmotu, Uvea, and the Savage Islands. Nearly all writers on Siberia agree that the position of the female shaman in modern days is sometimes even more important than that occupied by the male. Among the Paleo-Siberians, women receive the gift of shamanizing more often than men. According to the tradition, traditions of the Yakuts, there were formerly no male shamans or priests, but all magic functions were exercised by women. This was still the case until recent times, until the Kamchadals and the neighboring populations, the familiar spirit from whom every practitioner of the magic arts is supposed to derive his or her power, is spoken of among the Yakuts as his mother. In the languages of the Yakuts, Altains, Torgut, Kidan, Mongols, Kyrgyz, Buryat, the term for shamaness is the same while quite different words are used to denote male shamans. From this, Troschansky infers that before the separation of these races, all practitioners of shamanism were women, and that male shamans only appeared subsequently. Male shamans among the Yakuts wear long hair and dress as women. Whether they are wearing their ordinary dress or their ceremonial costume, and two iron circles on their apparel representing a woman's breasts. Male priests dressed as and impersonating women. The adoption of female dress by male shamans and priests is a worldwide phenomenon. It is prevalent among the North American Indians and variable throughout Indonesia, in Tahiti and the Marquesas, the priests of the Arioi stain their skin a light or more feminine hue and affect the manners of women. The Zulu chiefs perform rain-making ceremonies. They put on a woman's petticoat. Among the ancient Germans, male priests dressed as women. In Babylon, the priests of Ishtar and the Syrian goddess wore female attire. So likewise did the Corybantes, the Dactyloi, the Corytes, and the priests of Artemis at Ephesus, at Ephesus, the priests of Heracles at Kos, dressed as women when they offered sacrifice, as did male officiants in the festivals of Dionysus. 
The male assistants in cult scenes from Minoan Crete are represented wearing women's clothes. All priestly robes, skirts, aprons, sotanas are indeed everywhere of an essentially feminine character. On the other hand, instances of a woman dressing as a man when exercising priestly functions are altogether exceptional. Although women dress as men when exercising any prescriptively male occupation such as soldiering or hunting, in primitive societies wearing the clothes that have been used by another transfers to another wearer the qualities of the former one. Similarly, it is a universal principle that the distinctive dress of each sex implies that the person wearing it is engaged in the occupations which are particular to that sex. Let that sink in. I need to compress this or for a second. Do 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 do. Yeah, I know you're like, oh fuck you, Don. Fuck you. Keep reading. Oh my god. This is the part that started to mess with me. I'm like, I'm gonna drop my coffee. Oh my god, I'm trying to write notes in the marginalia. Let's see. Oh, you see, marginalia. Thus, for instance, among the tribes of California, every warrior, when too old to take part in active warfare, assumes female attire and thenceforward helps the women with their duties. It is frequently stated by those reporting that among a given people, certain men dress in women's clothes and follow women's occupations, that such men serve for the indulgence of unnatural vices. But it may be said positively, at least, so far as regards the North American tribes, that no grounds exist for this inter inference. Oh no. You're not attacking me. I'm not getting caught slipping. Oh no. I've got, I've got, I've got a shield booster. Fuck you. Fuck you, Grease. Just take that. Yeah, fuck me. In primitive societies, the assimilating of men exercising priestly functions to women goes much farther than the assumption of feminine apparel. In the Pelu Islands, for instance, it often happens that a female deity chooses for her priest a young man who is thenceforth regarded and treated in every respect as a woman. He assumes female dress and wears a piece of gold round his neck, and he also frequently takes up the cultivation of a patch of taro. In Cyprus, at the festival of Ariadne, the imitation was carried even farther, for one of the officiating priests lay in bed and imitated the groans of a woman in labor. Among the Yakut, it is actually believed that male shamans were capable of bearing children. In California, the male shamans assume female attire, because this is regarded as bestowing greater power, and the same is true of the Chukchi. In short, the universal practice does not seem open to any other interpretation than that magic was originally regarded as essentially a woman's function. It is a curious fact that smiths are widely held to possess magic powers. Yaku traditions connect the appearance of male shamans amongst them with the introduction of iron. The first male shamans, they say, were smiths. The profession of smith is hereditary among Siberian tribes, and the Yakuts consider that at the ninth generation a smith becomes a wizard. Among the Buryat, the spirits from whom men derive magical powers are called smiths, and are thought to have taught men the iron, worker, iron worker's art also. A proverb of the Kolima district affirms the blacksmith and the shaman are of one nest. Among the Mongols, the same word denotes a male shaman and a smith. Among the Romans, father, smith, connoted magician. In Russian popular tales, smiths act as assistants to witches. The Kayan Dyaks believe smiths to be possessed by spirits and that their skill is due to this. Similar estimates are general in Africa, thus among the Fons, the village blacksmith is the priest and sacred headman of the community. Tribes ignorant of the art of metallurgy regard smiths with such awe that if they obtain possession of a smith's bellows, they place it in their fetich house and address their prayers to it. The Arabs and Berbers ban all smiths from society. Dr. Schneider is 
probably right in supposing that this indicates that the art of the smith is regarded as a branch of witchcraft, and then those who practice it as the possessors of magical powers. In ancient Egypt, the priests of Horus were known as smiths. In Asia, wizards were the particular disciples of Tubal Khan, or Tubal Khan, as a lot of you uh, Christians would uh, also say. I have not found a spelling as he spelled it here as Khan. The smith in Ireland, St. Patrick produced against the spells of women of smiths and magicians. Such views accord with the belief widespread in Europe that smiths are the only men who share magical powers peculiar to women. The Mothers by Robert Briefolt. So, they think they are magical. 